should be good. Okay. All right. Um, this is uh, a basic guide to advanced incident response. Uh, I hope it's what you were in for. Uh, I'm Scott. I'm now going to show you a bunch of places that I work, so you trust me. Um, I worked at Symantec for a while. Uh, I worked at this little company called Mandiant. They got bought. Uh, I worked for this big, scary, bad movie defense contractor called Mantech for a while. Uh, I then went to this tiny little financial startup called Vigilant. They got bought. Uh, what you're picking out is my next company is definitely going to get bought by someone. Um, now I work for this little company called GitHub. Has everybody heard of GitHub? Okay, we're a sticker and t-shirt company that uh, does some Git hosting. Um, you have my card. If you need it, uh, I'm fairly easy to get a hold of. Uh, I spend my day mostly doing um, incident response-y kind of stuff. Now, the nice thing is I work for a company that seems to get the whole security thing, so I don't actually respond to a lot of our incidents. I get to spend a lot of time helping other people respond to their incidents. So, you know, somebody broke in, stole a bunch of, uh, you know, Git credentials and started downloading code. I'm the guy who gets to help. Uh, I also get to spend some time building tools to assist with these things because, um, especially if you're not in a Windows world, tools are kind of hit or miss in a lot of cases. All right, questions? Um, the point of this is actually not that I think you're curious about anything yet, but um, I got asked by my wife what this talk was really about, and I was like, well, it's actually what incident responders sit around and talk about over beer. Uh, I would love to take each and every one of you out for a beer and get your opinions on all these things, but we don't have time. So it would be better, um, yell at me, ask questions, interrupt me, I'm totally cool with that. Uh, I really enjoy this more as a conversation than anything else. Cool? Okay. Uh, one last thing you should know. Um, I always want to be a spy, and that will come up. So when I say a basic guide to advanced incident response, what I really mean is this big, scary, loaded term, intelligence-driven response. Um, at this point, does anybody think it's more than a buzzword? It, it, it's pretty tough. Um, when I hear intelligence-driven response, I thought I was going to be this guy, which seemed like it would be fun. Uh, I ended up as him, and uh, turned out it's just as fun in many cases. But uh, as much as that's kind of an overloaded term, there is some real truth to it. The intelligence community has a number of interesting ways to structure and look at data that, as security people, we can really use. Uh, if you go back with the you know, Sun Tzu example, that puts the intelligence community at about 4,000 years? I don't really remember. Um, and our community is at about 30, 40, if you really want to argue, maybe? So there, there's a lot we can learn. So this is the part where I'm going to tell you a lot of processes that end up being useful. Um, has everybody gone through, anybody gone through the SANS GCIH course? Remember this? just beaten into you. Ed Scotus just yelled it from the top. Um, so, so this is the, the SANS incident response process. So before an incident happens, you get time to prepare. As you work through it, you'll identify an incident. You know, an alert triggers. The FBI calls you up. Brian Krebs calls you up. Um, then you start to contain it. At this point, you move into eradication, getting rid of the the compromise, recovery, getting all of your services back online, and lessons learned. It's great, it's wonderful, it's very streamlined, um, but honestly, it's not realistic in a lot of cases. You can't really differentiate most incidents out this aggressively, and in many cases, you have to be doing four of these steps at the exact same time. So that's the security side of it. When you get to the intelligence side of it, they have this idea, what, what's called the intelligence cycle. Anybody seen this before? Got, okay, got two. I'm trying to get you to talk, it's the fun part. Um, so we start off with, in, in an intelligence aspect, you start off with what are the, the questions you're interested in asking, your requirements. You collect data that's useful for it, you put that data into a normalized format so that you can study it, work with it, manipulate it. You then try to develop actual answers to the questions posed during your requirements. You share that data with other people, and then you either make use of it 
and provide feedback on whether or not it was useful. Again, it's a great cycle, and in a purely intellectual world, it, it has a lot of merit. But in many cases, if you're actually the person running an incident response team or you know, working in a threat intelligence group, you can't sit there and just say, OK, guys, today we're going to be in requirements day. Tomorrow, we'll be starting collection. And Friday's tacos, and we're also going to be doing analysis. <laughs> so we started looking around, and, and again, we stole something, because that's way easier, and found an ability to marry these two ideas. Um, so this is colloquially called F3 EAD, because that's a mouthful. And it's, to us, the way that we combine this intelligence cycle along with this incident response cycle. So, so at the top, we have the security side of it. Um, find, which is, let's identify what thing we're looking for. So this is your preparation stage in incident response. And this is your collection, or uh, sorry, your requirement stage in intelligence gathering. You find the vulnerability. You, you figure out who you're looking for. You figure out what it's going to take to identify them, fix. And then finish is the security side, remediate, recovery, all that. Now, at the same time you're doing this, the way we think of incidents is you're also doing the intelligence gathering portion below. And that's this exploit, analyze, disseminate. So what's that mean practically? Um, as an IDS analyst, you come across uh, an interesting event. OK, that's, that's the beginning of your find. Now, at the same time that that event gets identified as something that might be worthy of an incident, you start trying to develop information on the other side of it, the exploit, analyze, disseminate portion. And the idea is these two cycles work at the same time. Is this making sense? Good example, bad example? First of all, I want to thank you for being the first person to answer a question, ask a question. Uh, second of all, generally speaking, you'll run this as two different groups. Um, so I've worked in teams where we did this at the same time. It works. It works really well. It just gets a little confusing. It's a lot better to have essentially an intel side and a security side. But the key is they need to be embedded with each other. Um, where this actually, where, where this whole idea came out of was actually uh, a special forces methodology kind of developed during um, the Gulf War, which was essentially um, a team of you know, special forces types shows up with a bunch of laptops they stole from some camp. They hand them off to an intelligence team. Six months later, that team comes back and says, here's all the things that we've got. And by that time, the, the special forces team's going, we already got them. They all disappeared, something like that. So what they instead started doing was embedding the intelligence teams right next to the special forces teams. I had a, a friend who got to work on one of these. And so they drop off laptops. Literally, the special forces guys would go to sleep. While they were doing that, the forensics guys were analyzing the laptops. And so when the special forces guys woke back up at night, they said, oh, here's 10 pictures of some more people you might want to go visit. And then the cycle continued. So the AB team does work. The key is both teams have to be really tightly integrated and, and working together. And that's what we were trying to do, was how to take that security cycle and the intelligence cycle and, and put them concurrently, not two separate things that fed into different time frames. So uh, the last one of these cycles I'm going to throw at you. What this is all trying to do is, is, what this, is, is improve what we call an ODA loop. And so an ODA loop is essentially a, a generalized idea of how people make decisions. And so you, you observe your environment to, to gather information, you decide what that means to you, so you orient. You make a decision on what to do, and then you do it. And it's, it's a really abstracted way of what, uh, idea of what we do all the time. But this works the same way for attackers and defenders as it does for fighter pilots, where this all came from. And so the thing is, if your attacker can do this loop faster than you as a defender, you're always going to be behind. You're never going to be able to beat them to a decision if they're making two decisions in the time you're making one. So th this is the academic portion of this. Does that, anybody have any questions? You're all experts on this. 
Fantastic. Putting that on my resume. Um, for some reason, but I've given this talk previously, um, this is where everyone wants to talk about active response, um, which is a great loaded term that everybody likes to talk about. And when you think about it, um, the way that active defense is recognized is these five ideas. Um, stopping something from happening, de deception, degradation, disruption, destroy. And I used to be really anti-active defense. I used to think it was a stupid thing people like to talk about. We're going to hack back everybody. Let's get a bunch of you know, IDS analysts with Metasploit, and hilarity is going to ensue. But the fact is, deny is something everyone does all the time. If you have a firewall, you're denying attackers something. Destroy, yeah, you can't do unless you're law enforcement or military. But the middle ones, deceive, degrade, and disrupt, are really things that advanced teams can eventually get to. But I'm guessing most teams aren't. I'll, I'll be honest, my team is not. So if you are, I would really love to talk to you about it. So I've convinced everybody that intelligence-driven incident response is the way of the future and totally how you're going to approach things from now on, right? So you've got to get some intelligence. Um, this has led to a very interesting, I think, uh, aspect of the security community, which is the cyber threat intelligence vendors. Um, does anybody work for a cyber threat intelligence vendor? If you're on the camera and you're working for one, just don't listen to this next part. Um, most of them are just going to let you download lists of stuff. There are plenty of places you can download a lot of these indicators from. Um, there are free lists. Um, I say all this having worked for one of these companies, by the way, where we were taking a lot of these lists and trying to turn them into better lists. And I'm not trying to say there's not a lot of value to that, but you have to understand the context around them. And we're going to talk a little bit about how to build some context around these indicators. But some common things that you can use to feed into the various uh, network defense systems you have are Obviously, IP addresses, URLs, domains, um, a lot of information about malware, um, hopefully in an automated fashion, because nobody wants to sit there and by hand analyze 10,000 pieces of malware. Um, and then information about certificates, email addresses, and user agent strings. Um, you know, these are typical information that you come across during an incident response that can be developed into further information. Any questions, anybody? No? Feeling good? Okay. So you take all these indicators and you develop this idea of events. I mean, this is kind of the most basic framework that a SOC is going to work under. You know, you have things that happen. Groups of, of, of events that are, have a malicious nature, we tend to clarify, classify as incidents. We put them all together, we say, this is incident foo. And what I find is most security operations centers drop everything on the floor at that point and say, incident's over. Let's move on, wait for the next one. But where this got really interesting um, in, a, in a particular group I worked in is we said, let's start classifying all of our incidents. So we'd work through our incidents and developed what we called campaigns. And campaigns were groups of like incidents that had just, just similar characteristics. You know, eventually when you've seen enough incidents, you start to develop a feel, you start to be able to put them together and understand them as, as a campaign. Now, we then started to see multiple campaigns that all were similar in their own ways. And this led to us generalizing their TTPs. Free sticker for anybody who knows what TTPs is. OK, I've got a pile of stickers, so you all actually all, can all get them. Um, but good job. Uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures. And so at this point, we got to a really interesting place. We started to understand a lot of these attackers that we were seeing on a day-in, day-out basis. Um, we developed names for them, some nice, some not so nice. And, and we'd started to get a feel for their personalities. And this seemed like an interesting academic exercise until we got to the point where we would see a new attack come in, have a idea ahead of time when we saw the technique based, the attack, attack based on their techniques, where they were going to go next and could try to sit there and be in front of them before they got there. So that's a powerful place. That was us getting, getting inside their ODA loop. And that's really what I think everybody needs to be aiming towards and, and what a lot of tools are trying to help us get to. The question we then had was how do we keep track of all this information? 
Um, and weirdly enough, it was just a basic wiki. Um, I don't know if anybody's using wikis for, for network defense kind of stuff, but it's an incredibly useful way to kind of group this information. Because while we had a very uh, somewhat structured taxonomy of how we were tracking things, it needed to be dy dynamic enough that we could put it into different formats or, or be able to, to change everything for a particular incident. But we also needed to be something that everybody could work on together. So uh, if you're tracking incidents in like text files or things like that, this might be a good direction to go. So we already said, you know, those are the interesting things to get uh, and to try to t gather intelligence around, but where do you actually get the data? Um, so uh, you, you can go to a vendor, and uh, there are vendors that have some, some useful information. Um, there's also a ton of information for free online. This internet thing is going to be big. Um, you know, there are plenty of people who get malicious, who are generating malicious IP lists and sharing them. Um, many of them are similar lists to the ones that the threat intelligence vendors will then come back and sell you for a lot more money. Um, you can use all kinds of uh, online services. I like IP Void, URL Void, and MyWatt. Um, people have done some amazing work with mining uh, virus total. Uh, if you want something interesting to read, Brandon Dixon, Virus Total. Um, he did some crazy stuff with tracking actors as they were uploading their malware to test if it was being detected on Virus Total. Uh, if you haven't played with Shodan, it's a really great uh, tool. Central Ops, Rob Techs, those kind of things. Um, I may have seen like I've kind of said some bad stuff about vendors so far, but uh, I want to be upfront. Um, they provide some great information as well. Uh, I think everybody kind of, the, the new standard got set when Mandiant released their APT1 report for not just including text, but also including a ton of indicators. Uh, we mine vendor information from a bunch of vendor blogs, podcasts, whenever they release reports, we read through those, gather information. Um, you know, th these are really rich sources of intelligence. Um, the only thing I'll warn you, to go back to my anti-vendor stance. Um, they are trying to sell you something, so take it with a grain of salt, use a bad email address, things like that. Um, th this is such a dumb thing, but it's, it's you know, again, when, um, when Google's Aurora incident came out, and they came out and said, we got hacked, and then 40 other companies all came out and said, we got hacked too. Those all didn't happen at the exact same time. So there has to be some ability for organizations to share information and to be able to get ahead of incidents before they strike multiple companies at different times. So um, at work all day, uh, this is like the most redacted slide I've ever put up. It's kind of useless actually, but um, GitHub um, is a company that basically lives in chat. Uh, we have about 75%, 70% remote workers. So um, this is the GitHub office to us. Um, I also spend all day in a personal chat with a bunch of other security people. And the, the point of this is just this idea of we're constantly sharing information back and forth. And it can be dumb things like links, or it can be dumb things like lists of IP addresses and samples of malware. Um, so trust groups are an interesting one. I, I love and hate them. Um, if you're involved in the trust group thing, it's kind of like Fight Club. You don't talk about it. I'm talking about it, so maybe they're going to throw me out. But there are groups of like-minded people who basically try to share information about threats. Uh, there are some that are really easy to get into, and you can get information about a particular segment of threat. There are some that are very industry dependent, so um, the FSI SAC for the financial industry. Um, and then there are some like this that were a group of companies that all got hit by the same um, denial of service attacks. So we all just kind of banded together and formed a, a group to start sharing information about these denial of service attacks. And this was best summed up by uh, a, a guy who's, um, I know I'm Zem Goffin, I can, Mike. Um, 
who had this point, this tweet, that gathering intel from others gives you a view of their world and then feeds into how you gather information about your own world. So developing your own intel, we've, we've talked about all these sources you can get it from, but what about your own intel? You know, what I said was we took this idea of let's start gathering information about events and making them incidents, but then let's not stop and let's keep moving up the chain. Um, I can't recommend that enough. Uh, if you have a mature security uh, program and you're not going back and digging through the last 50 incidents you've had to see what about them was the same, you're really missing out on probably a richer source of data than any IDS you have. So any questions on, that, on developing some intelligence? I know it's the middle of the afternoon. You guys didn't get a coffee break. I would have brought in Red Bull and puppies to get everybody excited. Any questions? Love the conversation? All right. Um, which is good, because I'm going to get into something a little controversial. So um, who got asked over the holidays about Sony? Who got asked if they thought it was the North Koreans? <sighs> it's an interesting question. And um, if, you, if you saw the article from Der Spiegel yesterday, there might be some new and interesting information. Here's my take. Um, unless you have bombers, um, an ability to actually get court orders that get followed, because, you know, we did indict all the guys from APT1, and I don't think they've shown up in court yet. Um, or your Thor from Swordfish 2. Um, uh, Attribution really doesn't do as much good as people say. Um, you know, reading reports that actually talk about who individual people are or give you unit names or something like that are interesting, but how much do they really change anybody's ability to react to security incidents? Um, I can say working in the defense sector, it didn't change mine very much. And if it didn't change for a defense contractor, I can't imagine how it would for a lot of other people. So there are useful aspects of attribution. Um, what I talked about where we worked up that chain was we started to develop an idea of attributing TTPs, um, common you know, technical sophistication, common goals, things like that. We had group names. We could attribute to a, a code name a lot of these types of information. What we really didn't care that much about was things like geography, who people work for, actual names. Um, it's kind of cool to be able to track someone down and show someone a picture, and then they say, can we do anything about it? And you go, no, they're in the middle of nowhere Russia. Kind of doesn't help. So this is all a great idea. You understand the, the, the techniques behind it, but, but where does it, how do you begin? Um, so to begin with, it's hard. Uh, I've, I've worked in two organizations that have gotten to the point where, where I feel like we've implemented about 80, 85% of this. Uh, and it's a lot of work. It takes buy-in from a lot of different groups, and it requires uh, a tremendous amount of perseverance. Because I'll tell you, it doesn't work at first. Uh, when you first start these type of techniques, you don't have enough information to go off of. You're, you're writing things down that you think you're never going to come back to again. And it's only after about six to nine months when you start seeing a, a really massive improvement in your, in your security stance. So to do that, you've really got to start by getting good management buy-in. You, you need someone who's going to have the patience to give you the time and the resources to make this happen. Um, but when you're going to management, don't FUD people. Um, it's really easy with all these, you know, massive reports coming out and things like that to say country X is coming for us. Be realistic about that and develop it based on real information, not just who the last, you know, group that got tweeted about was. Um, I've never mentioned this one before, but I think it's really important. If you're going to build a team like this, don't use the same network you're trying to defend. Um, if the bad guys have gotten all of your AD credentials 
and then can log directly into SOC Workstation 1, you haven't done as much to protect yourself as you'd think. Um, a capability like this requires you to develop a, a mature network forensics capability. Um, this one's tough because it tends to be a lot of expensive hardware to go along with uh, getting your network team to actually let you install any of it. Which, has anybody had to have that argument? Horror stories, huh? No, no, it's no fun. I promise this, I promise this flow monitoring system isn't going to take down our entire network. Even when you're 90% sure you're correct on that, it's still tough. Um, you'll need the ability to do system forensics. Um, we do less of this than I think we ever have before. Um, but when you have a compromised system, there are certain things that are, are really important. Um, I actually probably should have added something. Has anybody read the, what is it? Digital Forensics and Incident Response, the new third edition that just came out from the Mandiant team. Uh, if you're doing DFIR, it's a great book. Uh, and they talk a lot about uh, what they refer to as like live analysis. Essentially, you know, sets of scripts that go on and just grab pertinent volatile information, not necessarily RAM, but also not, you know, copying an entire hard drive. Uh, great. One of the, those two are fairly easy to, to get going. One of the tougher ones is actually developing information outside your own perimeter. Um, and, and this is kind of a weird one because it's actually something marketing teams are way better at than most security teams. So, you know, understanding things like sentiment analysis, monitoring social networks, um, all of these things are not just for the NSA anymore. You can do them at home. But they take a lot of effort and a lot of uh, custom uh, programming and things like that. Uh, I, I, people also ask about honeypots a lot. Is anybody running any honeypots? Do you get anything useful out of them? We are on camera, that's true. Um, I, I have run a couple honeypots before. I have gotten some interesting things out of them, but I feel like now that we've gotten past the age of uh, mass malware that just you know scans the internet looking for everything vulnerable, you know, the APT groups aren't trying to, you know, port scan your entire network before they, they come in. So that's the technology aspect. From a, from a personnel aspect, um, having a plan is really important. Um, does everyone have an incident response plan? You didn't realize I was going to be asking you so many questions during this whole thing, did you? Um, having an incident response plan is key, but testing it is also key. Um, having an incident response plan that you've never used before and then have an incident is brutal. And what you're going to find out is you were almost 60% wrong. Um, a quote from my dad, but it's, it's a great one in this case, is uh, he was talking about baseball. But when it's time to perform, the time to prepare has passed. Um, the importance of having a working IR plan that, that doesn't just exist, but you've also worked through, seen the kinks, revised, worked through again, uh, is, makes running a real incident a, a hundred times better than it would be just trying to make it up as you go along. And as soon as you get to that point, you also have to know when to completely throw your plan out the window and improvise. Um, it, it's a tough thing, but I've seen incident response teams that are so rigidly following their own procedures, they're missing obvious paths of action. So um, Chris uh, was a guy who works over at, I think, Ernst & Young in, in the UK. And uh, you know, he had a great point that uh, agility is what's really key for incident response. So if it isn't measurable, it didn't happen. If you don't have logs, you're lying, you're making it up. Um, how, if you've ever had a user come to you and say, I totally saw my computer do this thing, it was really weird that user is usually not correct. So if it's not measurable, it didn't happen. If you're doing your incident response and you didn't write it down, you probably don't remember it correctly. Um, it's really easy to kind of make up details for incidents after the fact. Um, it's kind of like fish stories, like, oh, I swear it was the APT-27. They were 16 inches long. I don't know, I'm mixing fish stories and APT <laughs> stories. but. But the details matter. And so good notes, good metrics are, are, are really key. 
It's important to, to trust your own instincts. Uh, it's important to not overthink everything. Um, it becomes really, really easy in an incident to assume the worst, to jump to conclusions, uh, and to, to not follow the, the details as they're in front of you. Um, we've talked a lot about collaboration. Uh, I work at GitHub. Collaboration is kind of what we do, so it's kind of a theme. Um, but at GitHub, one of the things that's been really key to us is um, we collaborate really tightly between our defensive team and our application security team. So um, every incident ends up with a vulnerability assessment, and every vulnerability assessment generally is an incident response. Um, because when we identify a new vulnerability, the first key has to be what, what, when was this vulnerability used that we don't know about? And when we have an incident that leads to a new vulnerability, they need to go triage, the, the AppSec guys need to go triage that immediately as well. Um, if you're also not making friends with your legal, public relations, and human relations teams, um, you'll pay for that. Um, if you followed the target thing at all, their security team and their, human re or their uh, public relations team were clearly not on the same um, page. So um, yeah, I, I actually ended up doing a bunch of writing about this, but um, Target's PR nightmare was made so much worse by the fact their security team and PR team were on two totally different pages. So if, if you're a security team lead and you don't know who your PR pe people are, um, I really recommend making those connections. Um, and the last one, since I like spies and you know stuff that goes along with them, uh, is a quote that comes out of the kind of the special forces area. Uh, slow is smooth, smooth is fast, and the corollary is fast is lethal. Um, it's when you're working through these steps, and it, when you when you get it down to a uh, set of procedures, it becomes really easy to just want to run through your your checklists as quickly as you can, run through your plan as quickly as you can. Slowing down can make all the difference in the world. Saving five minutes can save you five hours later. Um, I worked with uh, an incident responder who, um, I swear he sounded like a jazz radio DJ. Like, he'd come in and be like, so, I understand you're having an incident. We should talk about that. Can you give me some details? Meanwhile, I was 24 years old, and I'm running around going, everything's hacked, everything's owned, we're going to die. And one was productive, and the other one was my response. Any questions at this point? Okay. Um, so this tends to be the part everybody likes of this talk. Um, so some, some great IR tools that will actually be useful for implementing all of these things. Um, Google released a really cool tool called uh, GUR a few months ago, a few years ago at this point. They just actually put it onto GitHub, so it's now open source, as opposed to whatever being on Google code was. Um, and essentially, it's a defensive rootkit. That's kind of the way I think of it. it. It lives on your host systems. It gathers information for you, lets you do remote forensics, lets you do remote memory analysis, lets you say, tell me any system in my network that's currently connected to this IP address. And, and lets you do those kind of things on a system by system basis um, by phoning home to a, a remote server. Uh, it's, it's very cool. It's cross-platform, which is great. It runs, uh, I, I'm running it on OS 10 and Linux. It also runs on Windows. Um, it's got a, a nice web interface. It's a, a really cool tool for doing the kind of remote forensics that are important when you're running an international organization, like this guy. Uh, Moloch, uh, if, if you've used NetWitness but don't like the NetWitness price tag, uh, Moloch is what you're looking for. Uh, the AOL team uh, built this, and it's essentially uh, full content monitoring and data mining for all network traffic, uh, including pretty graphs and maps and things like that. Uh, as far as network tools that are not signature-based go, although it will do some signature stuff, it's the best thing out there. Uh, if you are looking for signatures, uh, everybody does love Snort. It's still one thread, right? or one process, right? I, yeah. Um, Securicata was, was basically built around all the parts of Snort that everybody loves, namely the signatures, and then they built a faster, more modern implementation. Um, 
Snort's great, especially if you're buying all the source fire tools, but for open source stuff, uh, I really like Suricata right now. Um, kind of along the lines of, of GUR, but a little bit lighter weight, um, Mozilla released a tool called MIG that uh, the, these again both sit on a uh, host and let you query it for information. Uh, OS Query was released by Facebook, and this one's interesting because it actually exposes an entire host remotely as a series of SQL tables, which initially was kind of strange, and then they started explaining the sort of things you can do. So, you know, select star from OSX kernel extensions where kernel extension not signed. Like, that's actually a really cool capability. Um, Full disclosure, I've committed to this project. I think it's awesome. Um, the Yelp guys released a tool for doing OSX live forensics, or I'm sorry, live response. So um, it'll sit there and you know pull information about you know all your kernel extensions, browser plugins, uh, browser history, what's in your downloads folder, you know things like that. That 95% of the time are all you need to conduct an incident response. And especially being that it's on Mac, where the tooling is mostly terrible, um, this has been one of my go-to tools. Uh, when you have all that malware information, one of the best things you can do with it is create Yara signatures. Um, Yara is kind of like an antivirus engine if it just came with detection and didn't do the terrible response stuff. Um, and lets you develop your own signatures in a really easy to kind of build format. Uh, Autopsy and SleuthKit are open source forensics, uh, like disk forensics tools for when you actually need to break down and you know tear through a hard drive. Um, I'm going to embarrass my friend Kyle Maxwell because he actually did two projects that were great, and this picture of him is kind of funny to me. Um, Maltrieve is kind of the sort of the answer I think a lot of people are looking for when they start doing threat intelligence stuff. It's it's set up to basically go grab a ton of different malware feeds, put them all into a nice, easy to use format to do things like feed into a sandbox or something like that. And then Combine does the same thing for IP lists, um, URL lists, the typical kind of threat intelligence vendor information. Um, memory analysis has become a fairly big deal. Volatility has been around for a long time. Google then forked it and made recall. Uh, both are, are great tools for doing memory analysis. Um, th this one's kind of a one-off, and it's awesome. Uh, it's called Scumbler, and it has a, a follow-up tool um, called Scummy. Another, another name along those lines. Um, and it's for mining things like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and all these different places where people post lots of social information. And being able to pull links, look for, for specific words, things like that. So there's not really anything else out there like this. Um, I think there are plugins for Scumbler that they haven't released yet. Um, Scumbler, as it stands right now, is really focused, but really good at what it does. So, you know, if you want to look for a keyword on, you know, a particular technology of yours or something like that, Scumbler is awesome for saying, here's all the people on Twitter who've mentioned X thing. Um, and then the, the add-on piece for it will then go and actually grab links in a safe way for you. So, for instance, you don't want to go to malware site X. It'll go there for you, pull all the information in a way that you know won't pop your brand new MacBook. Um, I use VirtualBox and Vagrant a lot for basically doing temporary environments. Um, these are kind of DevOpsy tools, but if you're not playing with them, I really recommend it. Um, got that huge pile of malware sitting around, Cuckoo Sandbox. I mean, it's been around for, for a while. It's an awesome tool. It's easy to get set up and I think for me does 95% of the malware analysis I ever really want. Um, for kind of tying all this together, you've got some sims. Um, OSIM by Alien Vault's great. 
Uh, I've been playing along around with Elasticsearch a lot. It's essentially kind of a Splunk sort of tool with um, a, a lot of flexibility going along with it, being that it's all open. Um, a, a cool one, though, that's also coming out is uh, Mozilla is building a sim based on the Elasticsearch backend called MozDef. And everybody's getting the joke now. OK. Um, and and MozDef is, is coming along. In, it looks like it's going to be really cool for kind of a, a new intelligence-driven sim platform, uh, as opposed to kind of the others, which are basically trying to be open source arc site. So you've <laughs> got more. <laughs> it's great. Um, so you've got more money than you know what to do with. Scott, I don't like open source. I'd rather pay people for stuff. Um, Here's a lot of basic tools that go along with the, the open source ones. Um, but a lot of times there's not even a tool for what you need to do. Um, in cases like that, there's a lot of great command line tools that can be tied together in some really interesting ways. Um, this is me using a combination of tools, in particular um, JQ, which is for basically parsing through um, JSON files. And so this is me taking one of our esoteric weird um, log formats at GitHub and making it so I can import it directly into Multigo. Um, super easy one-liner, figured it out once, just keep it on my desktop, use it all the time. Um, beyond that, if you're, like I said, I work on a lot of open source tools, um, some that I share, some that I actually aren't open source, I keep to myself. Um, but being able to develop some of your own tools is really, really important in our current day and age. Um, this was put really well by Postmodern, um, that we might actually figure out how to start automating stuff. Um, going along with that is this idea of DevOps, um, taking a lot of the things that we do on a, on a fairly common basis, like standing up machines for going to look for malware, um, you know, building out services, things like that. Being able to automate a lot of those things is awesome. So in conclusion, um, I think intelligence-driven response gets you to a, the answers you want faster, lets you do a better job protecting your network, and can really up your game as an incident response team. Uh, there's a ton of cool open source tools that will make a lot of that easier. and. Uh, Collaboration is actually the next step beyond all of that. Thank you. So I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, um, if you couldn't hear, I um, was talking about CRITS, which is a, a tool MITRE released for doing its collaborative research into threats, I believe is the name. Um, it, it's, it's very cool, a very cool way for, for tracking a lot of um, this common intelligence data. And, you know, a lot of these answers can, a lot of these questions can essentially be fed into that, and it can kind of help you collaborate that inside your own team as well as making it easier to share some of that stuff outside your team. So no, it's a very cool tool, and I kept thinking about trying to add a slide to it today, but I didn't have a screenshot, so I didn't know what to do. So. So. We were using, so I've, I've actually already open sourced um, some blog, or some uh, wiki templates that I was using for doing that. Uh, they were in Doku Wiki at one point. I think I updated them to Markdown, uh, which is what we use a lot at GitHub is, is Markdown documents. And so that's the, the framework that's under. Um, I've updated it a little bit with um, some of the F3 EAD stuff. And I don't know if I've actually pushed those up, but that's all on my GitHub 
um, which is github.com slash sroberts. So you can find that in there. Um, and that's, well, I'm actually walking away from this. That's actually really all we did at one point um, and was really effective. Now, I've iterated on that a little bit from there. I'm working on something I haven't, it's not quite ready for, for public consumption yet, but if you want to talk more about that afterwards, be happy to. So. So that's a great, that's a fun question. Um, how do you store all this data? Um, I'm not crazy about sticks or OpenIOC, which are kind of the two big generalized ones. Um, the reason is complicated, but can mostly be summarized as XML is awful and nobody really wants to work with it. And um, so, so I, I keep a lot in Yara. Uh, keep a lot in snort, keep a lot kind of in, in, I mean, almost basically just Python data structures that I can plug in somewhere else later when I need them. Um, playing around with doing a lot in JSON because it actually gets you a structured data format that human beings can look at and read. But um, that's honestly a tough, a tough problem. Um, Crits is great and I, I, I think it's a cool tool. But the fact that it wants to do everything in the miter, sticks, taxi, something, I don't even know. For instance, like the FFI stack for standardized is a sticks platform, and they all, they have a nice view and everything built in, and it's like, it's just like a readable format. Yeah. And I mean, you, you can, you know, Mandiant has done a great job with using OpenIOC, you know, another XML based format, and putting it into ways that people can use. Um, I just know I get sent enough stuff that I need to look at and triage before I can load it up into a new interface that that, that would be frustrating for me. So um, that's an interesting and difficult problem. And the question really is, who'd be the ones to decide what the right format is for the security community? Um, we don't really have a W3C for, for security. So anybody else? Cool. I'll be around. Thanks, everyone.